Hi, and welcome to Chapter 4. In this one, I'd like to go back to the past to show you some wonderful examples of social sustainability from some forward-thinking planners from way back when. Let's go. First, let's take a quick trip to Savannah, Georgia. Designed throughout the 19th century, these 22 squares of very human scales go across a one-square-mile area. They're a model of human scale and connected planning. Just like with the small squares of Budapest that I showed you, it's true that we need big parks, but we really need these small spaces to slow down a neighborhood and make it socially sustainable and connected. So with these parks, you almost always know you're going to run into somebody you know. It makes the neighborhood close-knit. They're easy, accessible places for social gathering. And this is really also important for dealing with the urban heat island effect in a city that's really hot already. This is kind of a classic savanna view. It's an alley of live oak with Spanish moss. This is kind of typical of these parks to have these beautiful trees forming these sorts of tunnels that you can walk through. The city truly became built around the squares, and today they're places of beauty and history that give people a reason to explore the neighborhood and socialize. They're not just attractive for tourists, they're attractive for the people who live there and call Savannah home. They also provide a beautiful and traffic calming setting for retail to thrive, so they slow the traffic down, they make it nice for walking and biking. Originally, in the 19th century, each of these squares had a small community of colonists living around it, with separate lots dedicated to community buildings. That's what inspired the first four squares. They were actually meant to be a form of defense, where there were military practices there. It's kind of hard to imagine looking at them now. But the city built a further 20 after those initial four. Only two have been lost, fortunately, and the remaining 22 are a very beloved and protected part of the city of Savannah. Another older example, I've talked quite a lot about Budapest since it's a place that I lived and called home and loved for a long time, still do. You saw the squares of Budapest, and now I'd like to talk about the courtyards. So you can't really see from the street front, but these are typical late 19th century facades. They're a mix of neoclassical, neo-Renaissance, neo-Gothic styles, a few Venetian. There were architectural regulations from the late 19th to the early 20th centuries that explained the building's layouts and apartments in the diversity of a Budapest courtyard. So the way these buildings worked, they were built to be like villas in uh, Renaissance Italy, so like the Medici Villa. They would have uh, about four or five floors and a courtyard in the center. But the difference was that these were meant to be individual apartments for individual families. Architectural regulations said that there had to be retail on the ground floor, and then the first floor would be the most elegant of the apartments on the front. And then as you went further up in the building and further back, the spaces got kind of smaller, the ceilings got lower, less ornate, darker, narrower, a little more awkward, so that by the time you got to the top of the building and the back of it, you had a very different apartment from the one that was on the first floor of the facade. This meant that you had a really diverse group of people living in the same building, so you had a really wide range of classes. There also were regulations that there had to be commerce on the ground floor, which gave it a really nice unity from the street level. This is the kind of thinking in planning that informed the renovations that took place in Paris in the 18th and 19th centuries. So it has a really beautiful unity to it. But let's have a look inside. So the regulations said that these courtyards had to be a minimum 15% of the building's footprint. Most developers would stick to the minimum because they didn't want the expense of, of a, bi a bigger footprint without bigger apartments. So that means a lot of these places, depending on the proportions of the courtyard, the height of the building, could be a little bit on the shady side. They were originally meant to be very functional spaces. There would be itinerant repairmen who would come in and fix things for you in the courtyard. There would also be uh, maids, because everybody had a maid back then. There would be maids beating the carpets, which was kind of a big center of social activity. Some of these have been turned into shade gardens. They look like they should be gardens. They were not originally intended to be that way, but many of them have become that. They create a great sense of safety because there's the buffer of a locked gate to the street. It's a semi-public, semi-private space. You can put things out that you wouldn't put out in a public space. You can let your children or your pets run around. So there are opportunities here that you don't have in a fully public space, yet it's not fully private either. They're really essential for the quality of life in a dense urban setting. They are cooling in the summer and insulating in the winter. It speaks to the importance of semi-public, semi-private spaces. There's safety, sociability, trust, and connection in these courtyards. Another great example of this would be in London, the common greens where several houses share a large common green space, so more public than a yard, but more private than a park. There are some examples of these in new housing developments in the U.S. as well. Here's another Budapest story. It's the story of the Weckerle estate. Where it starts is at the turn of the 20th century, 
Budapest was the second capital of the Habsburg Empire after Vienna. It was an incredibly rich, beautiful, fast-growing city. The countryside was another story. It was a lot poorer, so there was a lot fewer opportunity. So a lot of countryside people moved to the city for work because there was a lot of work there. The problem with that is that they were badly exploited by urban landlords. There was a um, real need for affordable housing in the city that was not being met. So there were uh, real slumlords, unsafe living conditions, poor ventilation, poor heating, really unfortunate living situations. So the state saw this and created an initiative to address unaffordable slum housing through quality architecture at a modest scale. And this is the key to it, is that it's at a very modest scale. So they created the Weckerle Estate in uh, an empty area on the outskirts of the city. About 10 architects, the best architects in the country at the time, all worked together to create an estate that would present cohesion without monotony. So when you walk around this estate and look at these buildings, you'll see some similarities. You'll see a sort of uniformity of scale, but there's so much variety when it comes to the ornamentation and the colors and the uh, individual details. So Art Nouveau in Hungary was very much about folk architecture. So this references peasant architecture from rural Transylvania, which is now part of Romania, but was part of Hungary at the time. This would have been familiar to the residents who were from the countryside, and they would have also known how to farm. And this is a very key part of the social sustainability as well as the economic sustainability. The buildings look like castles, but they actually contain small apartments as well as some retail. So it's a self-contained neighborhood. You didn't have to leave the neighborhood to run any errands. Each family were renters, and they were given fruit trees for their front and backyard. And this becomes very important because many of them were able to pay the rent out of the revenue from these fruit trees. So there's economic sustainability and self-sufficiency built into the process as well. It has very many slow, narrow streets, very beautiful public squares and playgrounds. So it has a very high level of livability to this day that makes this a place that people want to go to. It's also been very well maintained architecturally. It's still very sought after with very active neighborhood associations, local schools, very self-contained. It's got historic protection. It has a lot of community programming. The small size of the apartments and houses has prevented gentrification. So it's still very affordable. It's just simply not available. There's very little turnover here because people don't want to leave. People live here for generations. Uh, generations of children grow up together here. So now that we've been to Savannah and Budapest, we're gonna to head to New York to talk a little bit about Jane Jacobs and her celebration of the humble sidewalk. So let's go to New York and meet Jane Jacobs. <laughs>